Hello and welcome to another episode of The Cost of Glory, where it is our mission to retell the lives of the great Greek and Roman heroes in order to sharpen ourselves for the present. We take Plutarch as our guide. This episode is an audio transcript of an article that I just published with a new online journal, it's relatively new at least, called Antigone. Antigone's mission, as it states on its homepage, is to make classics open to all. And there are a lot of interesting pieces on topics about Greek and Roman culture and beyond, many from leading scholars in the field. Check them out at antigonejournal.com. So this article is not strictly speaking Plutarch material, but it does relate to the life of Marius that we just did, and it is more or less biographical and virtue-focused, so I thought it was in the spirit of sharing this on the podcast itself also. So here you go, The Joy of a Humorless Stoic, Publius Rutilius Rufus, by Alex Petkus. You often hear Stoics protesting against their critics these days. Stoics are cast as dour and emotionless, overly stern, even lacking in social judgment. On the contrary, some Stoics respond. Cheer, for example, can be found in the pure satisfaction of a virtue that needs nothing external to cheer it up. Why, Stoics can even be funny. Sometimes you may even wonder where all these critics really are with so many Stoics to be heard defending themselves these days. But it's true, there is a secret fear that gnaws at many people as they read about how stoicism can improve their athletic performance, mental health, business results, and love life. Yes, yes, but will I still be fun? Well, the question certainly bothered Cicero, the Roman orator, who was also one of the weightier ancient critics of stoic philosophers. And one stern adherent of Stoicism helped Cicero form a strong and lasting judgment about this question and about Stoic philosophy in general early on in his life. His name was Publius Rutilius Rufus. Rutilius was a statesman involved in the active life at Rome, not an academic, and he may therefore be a more interesting ancient role model for active people than, say, the scholarly Panitius or Posidonius. And Rutilius has been getting more attention lately, and he's worth re-examining now. This is not just because he was a textbook stoic and a noted critic of frivolous entertainment, but also because he allows us to ask a bigger question, what do we make of the life of a good man who repeatedly loses? In his recollections about Rutilius, Cicero usually remembers to add some bit of praise for the man's honesty and integrity, his work ethic and precision, But when Cicero met him, Publius Rutilius Rufus was a failed politician. It was the early 70s BC, and Cicero was traveling in Asia as a young student. Rutilius was in a semi-voluntary exile from Rome, and he ended his days in exile too, without ever returning to visit the home that had rejected him. How did he end up that way? Publius Rutilius Rufus was born in a middling upper-class family of Rome, around 154 BC, making him a contemporary of Marius and the Gracchi brothers. As a youth, he convinced his parents to let him spend inordinately long hours with the Stoic philosopher Panitius of Rhodes. Young Publius's case to his family for studying that supposedly effeminate Greek sophistry was strengthened when they learned that their boy would be frequenting the house of the great Scipio Aemilianus, also known as Africanus the Younger, where Panitius often taught. Maybe he'd meet some respectable kids there. Rutilius must have felt vindicated in his academic choice when Scipio picked him to join his retinue in the siege against Numantia in Spain in 134 BC. On that campaign, he served alongside future greats like the young Gaius Marius, Gaius Gracchus, and Jugurtha, who was still an ally of Rome at the time. And Rutilius' devotion to Stoicism advantaged him early on, but he was also sincere about it. As an indication of the fervent company he kept in his youth, take Aelius Tubero, a Stoic schoolmate of his. Tubero was a nephew of Scipio Aemilianus, but Tubero actually took all that live-according-to-nature stuff seriously. When the great man died in 129, Tubero was asked to arrange for the furnishings for his uncle's massive funeral banquet. 
Scipio, although he was an admirer of Stoicism, was also the grandest Roman of his day. In his eulogy, a different nephew of the deceased hero thanked the immortal gods that Scipio was born in the seat of the world's government and rose up to guide it. And Tubero, thinking that he would thereby honor Scipio's philosophical contempt for luxury, produced trappings for the feast which he thought his dead uncle would appreciate. Shabby goatskin mats to go on the benches and cheap Samian pottery for the dishes. And Crates the cynic might have been proud, or at least indifferent, but the Roman people didn't like the paradox. It cost him the praetorship, Cicero remarked of Tubero. Rutilius showed somewhat better judgment than his virtuous friend Tubero. Rutilius made praetor in 118 BC, and his first run for the consulship in 116 also gave him his first experience of battling Roman corruption. Both were spectacular failures. Not only did he lose the election to Marcus Aemilius Scaurus, he also lost when he prosecuted Scaurus afterward for electoral bribery. And then Scaurus, once acquitted, prosecuted Rutilius for the same charge. That case failed too. But after the scuffle, Scaurus was no less consul, and Rutilius's reputation was quite a bit dirtier for his effort. But a stoic dusts himself off, and gets back up again. Later, Rutilius joined steady old Quintus Metellus as a legate in the expedition to Numidia against Jugurtha in 109 BC. Since Rutilius practiced a stoic indifference to fate, he could be relied on to calmly stand his ground in an embarrassing fiasco. Two years later, with victory on the horizon, Gaius Marius, the new consul, defied the Senate, and he had the People's Assembly transfer command of the Numidian War from Quintus Metellus to himself. Metellus quit Africa in a huff before Marius got there, and he left Rutilius the honor of actually handing Marius the keys. Rutilius managed to win the consulship two years later, in 105, as a new man, a novus homo, The Romans were then faced with a war against northern barbarians called the Cimbri, an opportunity which promised glory and prestige to a competent commander like Rutilius. But, never one to sacrifice too lavishly to the goddess Fortune, Rutilius had bad luck this time too. The command went to the tacky nouveau riche Malleus Maximus. Rutilius, though, once again hardened his nose and set his hand to the home front, He hired gladiator coaches to show Roman soldiers how to duck and parry better, and he worked hard to win himself a reputation as an eminent military disciplinarian. Now, being a man of duty, according to the Stoics, Cathacon, Rutilius would never begrudge his efforts to a good cause simply because he might not enjoy the fruits. As operations against the Cimbri flagged, it was Gaius Marius appointed instead of Rufus, to take over command of that war. Then Marius decided not to bring his own Numidian army to Gaul, but instead requisitioned the new and obviously superior one that Rufus had masterfully trained. The Stoic was unruffled. Maybe he could see it as a compliment. Either way, Rutilius remained content in the knowledge that he had done a right deed. But of all the right deeds of Rutilius Rufus that were punctuated with humiliation, nothing tops his mission to Asia. Now in his early 60s, Rufus joined the like-minded Quintus Mucius Scaevola on a governing mission to the province of Asia. Asia was a cash cow for gangs of Roman equestrian businessmen. They held lucrative government contracts for things like extracting taxes from the trembling locals, a practice which was profitable in direct proportion to how abusive and extortionary it was. They were given the misleadingly friendly name of publicans, working for the people. Rutilius was considerably older than his commanding proconsul Scaevola, and though inferior in rank, he generously instructed his mentee in the punctilious arts of rooting out corruption. With their forces combined, they were shockingly efficient. A 
As their nervous staff looked on, the duo bankrupted or expelled many powerful and crooked operators. When Rutilius and Scyvola returned to Rome, they were commended in the Senate and politely praised during the more sober stages of dinner parties. Unfortunately, the equestrians controlled the juries in Rome's standing court for gubernatorial extortion, and the indignant businessmen found a prosecutor to assist them with some payback. Gaius Marius in those days was a great puppet master for the party opposed to Rutilius, and he was widely suspected of being involved too, but, as usual, he made it hard to trace his work. Lucky for Quintus Mucius Scaevola, Marius' son had just married into that ancient and storied family, the Gens Mucia, but somebody had to be thrown to the publican wolves, and poor Rutilius became the fall guy. The prosecutor had Rutilius called up on charges of extortion, race repetundi, and he ended up getting convicted by a jury of his foes of the very offense which he sought to curtail in Asia. His property was confiscated and he left Rome for good. And Rutilius conspicuously chose the province of Asia as the destination for his exile, a proof of his probity, as it were. And it was there that a 20-something Cicero visited old Rutilius at Smyrna, where he was taking a student tour of the East, hunting for the best advice from the best rhetoric teachers and philosophers. And Rutilius had been thinking a lot about recent Roman history lately, since he was writing his memoirs and a history of his own times. And Cicero sat and listened attentively as Rufus offered his take on what was wrong with Roman politics in general and with Roman oratory in particular. Too much emotional appeal. Rutilius recalled to the young Cicero the story of a legal case that he himself had once served in as a young apprentice for the defense team. Rufus was dispatched from the court to the house of the lawyer who was scheduled to speak last, Servius Galba, to make sure he was coming. When he arrived, he was asked to wait, and he sat so long he got nervous. But then, out from the cramped room emerged Galba, looking flushed and ready, and a few scribe slaves, pallid and shaken, whom Galba had spent the last few hours thundering at in order to practice his case. Such abuse! And then Galba came and stormed through his defense speech to tears and outbursts of applause from a packed courtroom. Those histrionics secured an acquittal for his client, could you believe it, against a prosecution team led by Cato the Elder. That summed up the problem for Rutilius. And that was why Rutilius Rufus, when he was preparing for the trial that would soon end his career, declined the help of Marcus Crassus and Marcus Antonius, the two most moving orators of their day. He refused to exploit the people's base passions and twist them to his own ends, Rutilius would allow neither himself nor any of his defense team so much as to stomp their foot in his trial. Cicero later retold the story of Galba's dramatic, tear-jerking performance, but with admiration. Now that was a man who worked hard and knew how to win. And in Cicero's eyes, Crassus was so good, he could have gotten Rufus acquitted even by a jury of vengeful mobsters. Wouldn't that have been better for Rome? especially considering the troubles that she faced shortly after Rufus's fall, the social war, Marius, Cinna, Sulla. Publius Rutilius Rufus is usually a side character, a support to other people's stories, as he is in my latest podcast series on the life of Gaius Marius. But he certainly deserves to have his story told well on its own terms. A relatively recent book, Lives of the Stoics by Ryan Holiday and Stephen Hanselman does this for a wider audience than Rufus has seen in a very long time. And Rufus stands out in that book among a lineup of other little-known but nonetheless story-worthy figures like Aristo and Diogenes of Babylon, and Rutilius's bio gets the subtitle, The Last Honest Man. The Lives, it's a series of short biographies, considerably more readable than the catalog of Stoics in Book 7 of Diogenes Laertius. Unlike Diogenes, it includes the more familiar Roman figures like Cato the Elder and Epictetus. And some of these guys actually were funny, and the book is very well researched and worth the time. Holiday and Hanselman's version of Rutilius owes some of its content and spirit to the moral and rhetorical tradition that rose up 
around Rutilius two generations after his death. On the one hand, Rutilius became a trite theme for young rhetoric students in the Roman Empire to harangue their classrooms with. For example, now compose a speech as Rutilius Rufus, refusing to accept Sulla's offer to cancel the corrupt verdict and restore you to Rome. That did happen, by the way. And this textbook moral example is the version of Rutilius that a miserable Ovid refers to in one of his epistolary poems from exile in Pontus. Quote, Now go and recall for us the examples of men of old who bore their fate with brave mind, and marvel at the heavy oak of great soul Rutilius, who did not use the opportunity of return when it was given, but Smyrna held that man, not the hostile earth of Pontus. Smyrna, a sight more desirable than practically any other. End quote. But more importantly for our modern Stoics, Rufus was a favorite example of Seneca. Seneca acknowledges that Rutilius was an example smoothed by overuse in the schools. See, for example, Epistle 24. But for Seneca, that just seemed to be confirmation that the stock Rutilius character really worked. So Seneca brings him up frequently and concisely alongside Socrates as a sage whose obedient endurance of an unjust verdict could help a Lucilius, his addressee, or us to steel ourselves for the slights and losses that we would face in our less exemplary lives. And the holiday Hanselman version, Lives of the Stoics, Rutilius, thankfully has more color than the rhetorical stock character in Seneca. Now, many laughs were had at Rutilius's expense in his day, no doubt many more than are recorded. And Cicero jokes that the defense team in the fateful corruption trial refused to show any emotions, perhaps for fear of being turned into the Stoics. Rutilius's friend, Lucilius, the Roman satirist, warned that Rutilius was a little too serious to read his own satires. But as his career shows, Rutilius Rufus was in fact widely loved and enjoyed many rich friendships, including with funny people like Lucilius. Friends came and visited him in his exile, and the residents of beautiful Smyrna adored him. He had a fascinating career and made a positive impact on the lives of many. And we might marvel, like the authors of The Lives of the Stoics, that so decent a man would rise so inordinately high in such a corrupt society. But the fact that someone like Rutilius flourished the way he did in politics, for Cicero, was surely an indication that there was still some good left in Rome back in those days. Rutilius Rufus is a reminder to us all that there can be great honor and joy even in a life mostly remembered for its embarrassments. Further reading. Cicero writes about Rutilius Rufus at greatest length in his Brutus and De Oratore, Plutarch's Life of Marius, Sallust's Jugurthine War, and Appian's Civil Wars provide the main narrative of his times, and the entry for Rutilius Rufus in the old Pauli Wissowa Dictionary is still a great starting point to find additional resources in the ancient sources for those with a basic grasp of German. So there you have the article. Thanks for listening. Stay strong. Stay ancient. This is Alex Petkus. <laughs>